Hey, what's up, guys? Sergeant Urban right here, and today we are going to be reacting to Napoleon Endgame, France, eighteen fourteen. The last episode, we witnessed the Battle of Leipzig, where Napoleon was actually on the defensive. Um, I think this is like his first time being on the defensive too, and he was crushed along with his army. And now he has to retreat all the way to the Rhine River, which is very, very far. And, yeah, the French are screwed, pretty much. They don't, they, they don't have much hope, except for Napoleon's genius. They are surrounded on all sides by enemies. Peace, peace, it's easy enough to say the word. It might to give up all that I possess in Germany. Napoleon to count Yug not I don't know. Paris, November eighteen thirteen. In October eighteen thirteen, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig. Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick, and demoralized, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. Oh but in November, the armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt Accept them. proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. Those are some pretty big natural frontiers. It was the... That seems pretty okay, though. Best offer Napoleon was likely to get, now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Yeah, like... Does, it, does he really think he's gonna win? Or maybe he expects to like win some kind of decisive battle and then have, you know, better peace terms. Sort of like what Germany did at the Battle of the Bulge, or what they tried to do at least. Even so, he did not accept the terms. He merely agreed to reopen negotiations. Donkey. To the Allies, and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. The war went on, and by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Why? Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Oh, no. So that just freed up a bunch of troops to go ahead and go that way. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, is now besieged. Wasn't there a port in Hamburg? Maybe they can try to, you know, just... Use some boats and go back to France. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army oh, come on, you're and fine. made to join the coalition. Just immediately invaded, and then bam, okay, I surrender. Wow. Oh, that is. Come on, man. That's, that's just rude. It reminds me of Italy whenever, like, just a tiny bit of their land is invaded, and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, let's switch sides. But obviously it's not that simple, but you know what I mean. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted oh, its no. independence after nearly 20 years of French control. Oh, okay. In Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy, Joachim Murat. You donkey, why would you do that? You were, uh, you were uh, yeah. why? King of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honor his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. Why, though? Why? Why would you do that? Why? 
Like, come on, man. That's rude. Why? 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 And what, what's even more ridiculous is that Naples would join Napoleon when he comes back to France from the island of Elba or whatever. Like, why? Why, why, why? You were, like, a pretty cool general. In Paris, Napoleon responds... Also, he looks dumb. Look at his, look at his dumb face. Look at the weird... What even is that? What do you call that? On, like, that hair on his face. What the heck is that even called? Responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Like what? Property taxes doubled. State salaries and pensions suspended. 300,000 new conscripts called up. Dang. From a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years to try to shore up his support in Italy. He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain. Except... A condition that Fernando was in no position to honor. Uh, rude. But these concessions were too little, far too late. In January, two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. How? Darn! In World War II, at least Germany was able to, like, hide at the Rhine for, like, forever. And then these guys just immediately cross. Wow. Lucas army of... It's, there's a lot of them. They even cross in... They cross there. Looks like they're about to cross there too. Silesia and Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. What are they going to do now? Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. Yeah. On the twenty fifth of January, they're going to get Paris. Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace before leaving for the front. He would never see either of them again. What? With just seventy thousand men. He faced odds of four to one. Oh my god. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. But for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. A weird, that's a weird bonus, I guess. Okay. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. Nice. If the enemy are foolish enough to cross the Rhine, I will march to meet them. Then you will see the meaning of the world, of the word debacle. Napoleon oh. to cow No. You need to know. You I don't know you. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The Emperor advanced rapidly, yeah, hoping to trap and college. destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. Arr. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. Nice. As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher... What would happen to 20,000 of his troops? What the heck? Also, it said he recruited 300,000. Where are the other, like, 250,000? Where Every are they? reinforced by Schwarzenberg made a surprise attack at La Rothière. Oh, no. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village 
defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. Oh my God. By late afternoon, Raider's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties oh, and 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. Oh no! The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Oh wow! Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance. Oh come on, he's Napoleon. So long to attack. To ease pressure on the roads, Bucher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. But dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon's hands. Oh yeah, that's a pretty donkey move. Study of it has given me a greater idea of his genius than any other. Duke of Wellington on Napoleon's 1814 campaign. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. <laughs> Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. <laughs> oh, aggressive nice. Blucher racing ahead, while the more cautious oh Schwarzenberg lagged behind. You silly sausage, you're gonna lose. Dino and Victor to guard the Seine bridges, delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. Jeez. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oh. oblivious to the danger it was in. This is the attack and this is the like defeat in detail thing I was telling you about in like previous episodes. Now it's like showing it to you right here. Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champauvert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. Oh my god, that's more than half of its entire army! The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much larger force, with two infantry and one cavalry. Yeah, I think I saw that like 18,000 troops. was expecting support from York's Prussian 1st Corps. Oh, no. But the Prussians were late, <laughs> oh, and nice. Sagan's troops nice. could not withstand the French onslaught. At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite Old Guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. Wow. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another three and a half thousand casualties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. Nice. But York's Prussians got there first. Oh no! The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rear guard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont. Oh my gosh. Napoleon like has z like literally zero troops. How how does he expect to win this fight? Who had been left to keep watch on Lucha? Napoleon. I think I said earlier he had like thirty thousand troops. And he just went into like two battles. Attacked at Vauchamp, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Lucha's oh, army, nice. which was soon in headlong retreat. What? A merciless French pursuit inflicted six thousand. Russian and Russian casualties. That is insane. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Wow! Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size and beaten it four times in just six days. Blucher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle and another 15,000 in smaller engagements as stragglers or deserters. That is amazing. But I, there's a look at, look at 
Valshan. Wait, I think that's how you pronounce. Ten to one casualties, and over here, five to one. But that's now, the crazy. army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. But he saw his army is in the south, right? So that's going to be a problem. But in the south, Marshals yeah. Victor and Udino had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. I mean, what do you expect, Napoleon? You expect your darn, like, young conscripts to beat them? Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. Oh, goodness. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon what? raced south. This looks so risky. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. Wow. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, oh, no. routed <laughs> at Mormain with oh 2,000 casualties. Wow. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau, but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gerard. Dang. The next day at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river with 30% losses. Wow. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself as he had at Lodi, 18 years before. Wow. Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? Oh, yeah. Because Napoleon is inevitably, uh, inevitably going to lose. You know, it depends on when it's going to happen. These victories can't last forever. Recollect what your military position is. If we act with military and political prudence, how can France resist such a peace? And how can France resist a just peace demanded by six hundred thousand warriors? Fletcher, if she dare. Oh. Orders Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh to Metternich, eighteen February, eighteen fourteen. Well. The Allies are going to reorganize. I guess Napoleon time to reorganize and train his conscripts. Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened. Oh yeah. Chatillon sur Seine on the fifth of February. That's good. The Allied terms were now more severe. More severe? You just got your army crushed. Come on. A return to France's frontiers of seventeen ninety one. Oh no! That were these were actually like the real borders that ended up happening in real life. Well, at least um, before Napoleon went ahead and went into France for the second time. Seriously, wow! Though that's pretty small. Which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals, hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. Mm -hmm. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France, while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy to be shared among the Allies. The treaty's secret articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Yay. Switzerland, and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons, Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. 
A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last best hope for a favorable peace. That was gone. And news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without what? a fight. Nancy, Dijon, and Macon had all fallen. Oh, so what happened to Switzerland? I thought they were with Napoleon. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, oh, God. forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. Why? The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialized. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. Rude. French peasants took revenge when they could, but there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. But, wh but why? You would think that the French would have a lot more nationalism. You know, wow. why is there no guerrilla warfare? That would have, like, if it was, why is, like, if it would have, if the guerrilla warfare would have been like how it was in Spain, France would have won, seriously. Eclipse, come on. Not here. I guess he doesn't like desire among ordinary French people was for peace, at Dang. almost any price. Dang. Dangers crowded upon him, encompassed him, oppressed him from every side, but he sought to escape from them by misrepresenting them to himself. Oh, just like, you know, what um, Hitler did, sort of, at the end of the war. Marquis? Alan Court, the French foreign minister. Come on, Eclipse. Come on. Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. The French emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. Wow. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety ah, behind geez. the river O. Oh boy. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal MacDonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads hey, choked with That's 20 miles a day. But at Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers. Nice. Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Erne River because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But yeah. after just a day's fighting... The... Wait, the Polish are still helping them, that's nice. Garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered, allowing Blücher to escape. Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Aisne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. Oh, come on. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Napoleon pushed on to Long. Napoleon, you're just overstretching yourself. You're not going to win this. 
but by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces. 98,000 troops in all. Wow. And outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon oh. was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons, and after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon oh, as he no. found out Napoleon had gone north. Yeah, you donkey. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River Oak. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Oh, goodness. Ah. Napoleon advanced on Arcis sur -Eure. Ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating, as he believed, but gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, oh, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. No, you donkey. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. Only 28,000? Desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. Jeez. But the odds were too great. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. Oh, no. What the heck? I sought a glorious death, disputing foot by foot the soil of the country. The balls flew around me, my clothes were pierced, but none reached me. Did he want to die? What? Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly. So he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing oh. them to abandon their advance on Paris. Well, that worked, though. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Oh, goodness. Talleyrand, the most brilliant French diplomat of the age, and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807 he fell out irrevocably with the emperor over foreign policy. He now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin and worked behind the scenes no. to ensure his downfall. From Paris, no. he wrote to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling, and the city's defenses had been completely neglected. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. What? 
No. Information was confirmed no. when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. Why? The treasury, arsenals, and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. At Fair Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join Napoleon. An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war. Oh. Maybe you can try to do what Russia did, possibly, and you know, do, do scorched earth. Who knows? I don't know. Oh. might not recover. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defense in person. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-king of Spain, was in charge of the city's defenses. But had done little. Yeah, what defenses? Paris was awash, rumors of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their nice. troops to the garrison. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard, but many more young conscripts while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city. And given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. Where is Napoleon? That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city, on condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. At the Hotel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrurier oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. For 15 minutes? When he was informed of the city's surrender, he sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. Oh. I do not intend to expose Paris to the fate of Moscow. Oh. Marshal McDonald to Napoleon. On the 31st of March, 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Wow. Parisian crowds cheered the three Allied monarchs, bringers cheered of peace. 
everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Why? Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's savior. Even by the French? Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs Elysees. Allied troops generally behaved well. Generally. 35 miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted after their 100 mile forced march. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. Oh, but for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, MacDonald, Oudinot, and Berthier. Wow. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France. He accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favor of his son, if possible. Oh. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favor of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces for himself and his heirs the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Napoleon's abdication was formalized by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle with more than 7,000 casualties. Oh. The night after his abdication... Like, even if, even if the war wasn't over, well, what would that have accomplished? Napoleon tried to commit suicide using the poison that had been made for him in Russia in case of capture. But it had lost its potency, and he survived. Two weeks later... Oh, that must suck. He had to, like, endure, like, this expired poison he ingested. Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace, and began his journey into exile. I have been wrong, maybe in my plans. I have done harm in war, but it is all like a dream. Napoleon, found some below palace. 12 April, 1814. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. But not yet. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. Oh, wow. Most soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. Oh. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe, imposing treaties on humbled enemies, redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. He was the last figure in history to combine total political power with frontline military genius in the mold of Alexander and Caesar. But it seemed Napoleon's reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, 
Exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign. What? I thought the people didn't like Napoleon and, you know, their regime. Like, remember earlier that they were all cheering for the monarchs and they were declaring their loyalty back to the king? Like, like what is it with this image? To reclaim his throne. Ah, that was loud. Wow. Well, if you, wow, that was great. They had a few extra, you know, cool battles that he won, proving that he's still the competent commander he was, like, you know, four years ago. Next episode, hopefully, yeah, the Battle of Waterloo. Very famous battle. Um, it'll be the last episode, I mean, unless y'all want me to react to Napoleon's Marshals. I don't, I'm not really sure if y'all want to watch that. Yeah. That one's only 14 minutes long. But, whatever. Um, you know, if y'all would like to leave that, leave a thumbs up and like, subscribe, do all the other things. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And, you know, turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you didn't, then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down. Oh so, yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm all right, I go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not, better than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that... I either know or I have high and high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So thank you for watching and have a great day.